All right. Good morning, Title I coordinators. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar of 2024. My name is Erin Suddeth, and I'm the branch manager for the Title I Part A Support and Improvement Branch here at KDE. Um, we do ask that as you join, make sure that you've got um, your microphones muted and your cameras turned off just to allow all of the participants to focus on the presentation. We will have time at the end for questions. So at that time, if you want to um, use the raise hand feature in Teams and then come off mute and ask your question, you can do that. You can also just drop questions in the chat at any time, and you can send them to me uh, via email at erin.suddeth at education.ky.gov. And of course, we are recording the webinar and it will be posted to our Title I uh, webpage either later today or sometime tomorrow. If you weren't able to join us last month, be sure to go back and watch that recording, which is available on the web page. Just a quick review of what we talked about last time. We had some timely announcements and reminders. We went over our December newsletter highlights, and we had kind of a, a special section where we introduced um, some people from Public Consulting Group or PCG, and that is the vendor that we've contracted with to um, provide the Title I Next documentation storage platform to districts who are interested in opting in, and you should have received an email with some more information about that from me earlier this week. We also talked about planning for revised allocations the upcoming release of census data and hold harmless data, and then how that census poverty percentage compares to the district poverty percentage that you calculate using something like free and reduced price lunch. And that's something that we get a lot of questions about whenever that data is made available. So if um, you weren't able to watch that, be sure to go back and do that because you might um, have some questions about that. So for today's agenda, we've got some more announcements and reminders, and then we're going to focus on an equitable services overview. We're going to look at um, eligible private school students, the private school intent to participate, and then the consultation process and providing services to participating private schools in general. So as I mentioned, we talked about um, census poverty and hold harmless data in our December webinar. That document um, is now available on the Title I Part A Documents and Resources webpage, and the data that's in that document can be used to begin planning for the 24-25 school year. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that since we just did it in the December webinar, but two quick reminders. Um, remember that all of those numbers in there are tentative, so they are subject to change. And if you think that there is an issue with the data and you need to challenge it, you need to do that by contacting um, the SAPI branch, Small Area Income and Poverty Estimates branch at the U.S. Census Bureau. And if you look at the document in the, the first couple pages, there's instructions on how to do that. KDE doesn't have the power to change or do anything with that data. That's not our data. So you have to uh, contact the Census Bureau about that. And the period um, to challenge the data, that ends on March 13th. And of course, be sure that you are still monitoring that obligation of 310K funds. That's this year's funds. You want to make sure that you are still on track to meet the 15% carryover limitation. So we've been going over this since about October. Um, helping you make sure that you are going to have at least 85% of the current year's allocation obligated by September 30th, 2024. That's the deadline. And based on the very general guideline of obligating about 5.5% per month, by the end of January, you should be at about 39 and 40% obligated. So um, if you've obligated significantly less than that, you might want to meet up with your finance officer and just kind of review things and make sure that everything is being coded where it should be. See if you need to maybe revise any plans and, and make some changes that'll get you back on track to um, meet that obligation. 
If you haven't had a chance to look at the January newsletter, it is on our documents and resources webpage, and it'll stay up there for a year. Of course, if you're not currently subscribed, you can do that directly in the newsletter, or you can just reach out to me and I'll get you added to the list. So the topics that we included were an announcement about the Title I Next platform and our um, contracting with PCG. We had a reminder about updating person role manager. We run that um, fairly regularly. You need to make sure that you're checking open house and see who's listed as Title I coordinator for your district. Make sure it's the right person. That, that way that person is getting all of the information about Title I from KDE. We had a Title I resource overview. I know we have a number of new coordinators who just uh, started with the program in December or even um, early in January. So that might be useful for you to just see some of the resources that we have available. We had an in case you missed it article where we just kind of summarize and link to one of the articles that came out in the ESEA Now publication. And this one was on annual parent and family engagement uh, feedback surveys. And we had an announcement about an upcoming uh, and ongoing professional learning opportunity from the Brewman Group, and that is their Education Department General Administrative Guidelines, or EDGAR Academy. And don't forget to share um, information from our newsletters and our webinars with any applicable staff in your district. So finance officers, homeless coordinator, building principals, anyone who you think may be interested in that information. And of course, they can um, subscribe to the newsletters or participate in the webinars if they're interested as well. So moving on to our main topic of equitable services, uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, does require districts to annually offer equitable participation in Title I Part A. Um, services to all of the private schools that have children from participating Title I Part A attendance areas um, in them. I've put the word services in bold just as another reminder that private schools are eligible to receive Title I services, not Title I funds. They don't just get a check of funds. The district maintains control of Title I funds at all times. The private schools located within the district's geographical boundaries, as well as those outside the district, are eligible to receive Title I Part A services. And Title I is the only Title I program that provides those services to schools outside of the district. We're going to have more information on that in a minute, but that is different from the other title programs, Title II, III, IV, etc. And remember that our home schools are treated as private schools in Kentucky, so they need to be contacted as well. You may also um, hear the terms during this presentation or when you're looking at other resources, you may hear or see the terms non-public and private used fairly interchangeably. I'll also be referencing the non-regulatory guidance several times throughout this presenta presentation, and there is a link to that guidance at the end of the slides. So if you've never um, read through that guidance, be sure to take a look at it. It's got a lot of really useful information about equitable services. So first up, let's talk about the students that are eligible. And uh, this is included in the non-regulatory guidance, question C10. So 34 CFR 200.62, uh, this defines eligible private school children as children who reside in a participating Title I public school attendance area of a local education agency, regardless of whether the private school they attend is located within the LEA. So it's the LEA or the district in which the child resides that is responsible for providing services to that child. The funds that are generated for services um, by these students, they can cross the district's geographic boundaries. These funds need to be used to provide services to the students from the districts in which the funds were generated. And as I mentioned a minute ago, this is unique to Title I Part A. And we're going to hear more about how to provide services to students um, from the district where funds were generated shortly. So every school year, it's usually late winter, early spring, sometime um, around now or, or coming up soon, the district must contact the officials from all private schools serving students in participating school attendance areas. We do have a sample letter of notification and participation survey on our uh, web page in the Title I Part A sample documents folder. You don't have to use that. Um, you can take a look at it and use it or just get ideas to create your own. 
the district can set up a reasonable deadline, um, taking into consideration the private school's schedules for the private schools to indicate their intent to participate. So you want to be sure that you provide a clear and sufficient notice of that deadline and identify potential consequences for not meeting the deadline. An example of a consequence would be that the eligible students do not have the opportunity to participate and receive services for that upcoming school year if the private school doesn't um, express their intent to participate by the deadline that uh, you've established. And I really just want to emphasize um, considering to include a reasonable deadline in your intent to participate letters. We occasionally hear from districts about a private school that is taking a really long time to decide if they want to participate or one who initially said they don't want to participate and then they change their mind and they say that they're they do want to participate. So if you're clearly communicating that deadline in your letter, that should help you eliminate some of those potential complications. Um, in the past, we usually cover this um, topic of private schools and equitable services in our February or maybe our March webinar, but this year I wanted to move it up earlier um, so I could get this reminder in there and give you time to go and review your intent to participate letter and maybe make revisions if you wanted to include some information like that. So the district has a responsibility to contact all of the private schools outside the district if they have reason to believe that students who reside in a participating Title I public school attendance area attend those schools. So when you start reaching out to the private non-public schools regarding participation for next year, you want to be sure that you're including those schools located outside of your geographic boundaries that are being attended by students who would otherwise attend a Title I school within your district. Now, you might not be aware of every instance in which a student who resides uh, within your district is attending a private school outside of the district. So if the private school thinks that it may have some eligible Title I students from your district um, and they haven't been contacted by you, then it's a good idea for that private school to reach out to you about um, making sure that any eligible students are considered for Title I services. And that information is in question A5 of the guidance. You want to make sure that you are documenting how you notify the private schools. Now, the method that you use to notify them is completely up to you. But again, like I said, you want to make sure that you're documenting it. Um, in the event that you're selected for monitoring, that's one of the things that we will ask to see. How did you notify um, any participating or non-participating private schools? Um, some districts choose to send a notification using certified mail, um, but that's not required. You could also send, um, send an email. You could do that with or without a read receipt. Uh, during consolidated monitoring, some of the examples of documentation we've seen for this are um, dated copies of the notification letter, um, even the envelope that it was sent in, um, or saved emails. Like I said, a read receipt isn't required, but that is a pretty easy way to document that the email was received and opened by the recipient. You could also within your email just request that the private school respond to you and indicate that they have received it. Now you're not required to submit these intent to participate forms to KDE. This differs from some of the non-public school information that you submit to KDE for titles uh, 2, 3, 4, and IDEA B. So what is the difference between the intent to participate and the declaration of participation? They have very similar names, and so it can be really easy to get confused about which one is which. So the intent to participate letter, that is specific to Title I Part A, not the same as the declaration of participation that is submitted in GMAP. Um, OK, I said it applies to Title I Part A. This is for private school students, um, private school serving students who reside in participating school attendance areas. And as we've already said, that may include private schools that are outside of your geographic boundaries. The information on those participating private schools is going to be included in the Title I Part A application. Now, the declaration of participation, 
That applies to Title II Part A, Title III, Title IV Part A, and IDEA B. And the private school membership data um, that is submitted through this directly impacts the per pupil dollar amount allocated to districts for Title III and IDEA B. This is for private schools that are physically located within the district's geographic boundaries. You don't go outside of your boundaries for this one. And this information is completed by districts um, in the application supplements section of the GMAP platform. I do want to point out that information regarding the declaration of participation for the 24-25 school year has not been released yet. Now, when that information becomes available, it is sent out through the Commissioner's Monday message, um, and additional information about it is also available on KDE's additional federal grant information webpage. Like I said, that has not been updated for the upcoming school year, so if you go to that webpage right now, you're still going to see all the information for the 23-24 school year. I'm going to move on and talk about um, consultation with participating private schools. The initial consultation meeting happens after the private school expresses an intent to participate in Title I Part A services for the upcoming school year. Districts are required by ESSA to provide timely and meaningful consultation to private schools um, that elect to receive services. So this consultation occurs between um, district officials, usually the Title I coordinator, possibly some other people, um, that represent the Title I program and private school officials that will help with the consultation process. So usually the principal, maybe some other people as well. Districts and private school officials shall have the goal of reaching agreement on how to best provide equitable and effective programs to eligible private school students. So this is a conversation, a consultation. You want to try to come to an agreement uh, if at all possible. And there is a list of some consultation topics on pages 37 and 38 of the Title I handbook. Now, upon um, receiving further information during that consultation meeting, you may have a scenario where a private school decides they don't want to participate in the Title I program, and that's fine. At that point, you just want to make sure that you documented that decision, and then no further action is going to be required of the district for the upcoming school year. You, the following school year, you will still want to reach out again and see if um, they've changed their mind and maybe want to participate. The district is the one that initiates the consultation process. And it must include uh, early discussions because you want to be able that uh, be sure that you have time to prepare for the upcoming school year and have a timely start to the Title I program at the private school. Now, ESSA doesn't outline a specific month or anything where that needs to occur. Uh, we recommend that consultation occur in March or April. The consultation must occur during the design and development of the program and before the district makes any decisions that affect the opportunity for eligible private school children, their teachers, and their families to participate in Title I. Consultation is an ongoing process throughout the school year. Um, this helps you ensure effective implementation, um, service delivery, and assessment of equitable services. And Title I services being provided at private schools, that is the responsibility of the district. They need to be monitored just as the district monitors the services taking place at its public schools. Section uh, 1117B3 of ESSA states, such meetings, meaning the consultation, shall continue throughout implementation and assessment of services provided under this section. So that wording that is in ESSA does indicate that consultation is an ongoing process. We do have a consultation agreement form. It's called the Equitable Services Consultation Packet, and that packet must be used during consultation meetings to help guide the conversation between the district and the participating non-public school. The packet contains a needs assessment for each federal program and a non-public school consultation agreement. So programs included in the packet are Title I Part A, Title I Part C, Title II Part A, Title III Part A, Title IV Part A, and Title IV Part B. 
you want to make sure that you jointly complete the applicable needs assessment or assessments if you've got um, multiple programs that the private school wants to participate in with the non-public school. You want to maintain signed copies of these packets at the district office, and you also upload the completed signed packets into the GMAP district document library. So you'll do that when the FY 2025 consolidated application opens. Now, if the school's not participating in one, one or more of the programs that are in the packet, there's a little box for you to check that says they're not participating in that one. So be sure to do that. It is still necessary to submit the entire packet into GMAP. So even if they're just participating in Title I Part A, don't just put those papers in there, submit the whole thing. Let's talk about how funds are generated for private schools. So in order to generate funds for equitable services, a private school student uh, must reside in the district's participating Title I public school attendance area. So if they were not attending the private school, they would be going to a Title I served school within your district. And they must also be from a low income family. Now, if there are no students from low income families that are attending a private school, then no funds are going to be generated for that private school. The number of low income students that reside in a particular particular public school attendance area that are attending participating private schools is documented in GMAP. That's on the school eligibility page. And when those numbers are put in there, GMAP automatically calculates the equitable share of the total Title I allocation. Remember that low income status is not a requirement in order to receive Title I Part A services. So low income students, they are the ones who generate the funds for the services, but then the services are provided to the students who are the most at risk of failing to meet academic standards. In terms of the time frame for obligating funds, uh, ESSA 1117 A4B states funds allocated to a local educational agency for educational services and other benefits to eligible private school children shall be obligated in the fiscal year for which the funds are received by the agency. This helps ensure that the funds are used to provide services to the students who were identified as at risk when those funds were generated. So if the LEA is providing equitable services as required, as you've laid out in your consultation agreement, and you're meeting the obligation of funds requirement, in general, you shouldn't have any carryover. You definitely shouldn't have a significant amount of carryover uh, for your private schools. The district has a responsibility to monitor the spend down of these funds, just like you do at the public schools. This is the district's program, and it's the district's um, who's responsible for ensuring timely spending. Failure to spend private school funds in a timely fashion or in the year that they were generated is a somewhat common finding that we see during both desk and consolidated monitoring. So you want to make sure that you are um, doing careful planning and having intentional and ongoing communication and consultation. Those are huge factors in ensuring the timely expenditure of funds. Um, back to establishing some more reasonable deadlines. So this comes from non-regulatory question, uh, non-regulatory guidance, sorry, question B31. So as you're going through that consultation process, you may want to establish some reasonable deadlines on private school officials to facilitate meeting the obligation of funds requirement. We know that the district is responsible for ensuring that the funds are spent timely, but Sometimes that spending is contingent upon an action by somebody at the private school. So the example that's given in the guidance is the district is planning to reimburse a private school teacher for attending a Title I professional development. So in that example, the district sets a deadline for the teacher to participate in that PD. So if you've um, established that deadline in consultation and in the context of um, the requirement to obligate funds in the current fiscal year, it would be reasonable for the district to inform private school officials that if that deadline is not met and the private school has not reached out to the district saying, hey, we've had something come up. These are the obstacles we've had in meeting this um, deadline in a timely manner. 
then the district may consider the private school to have declined services. And again, the required um, ongoing consultation between the district and the private school is going to help prevent this type of situation from occurring. I mentioned that consultation is ongoing. It is not a one time thing. You want to be in communication with the private schools just like you are with all your public schools. Be sure that you are documenting that communication through uh, detailed meeting minutes, maybe phone logs, email correspondence, etc. All of that helps serve as some proof that the district is doing its due diligence in working with the private school to meet the obligation of funds requirement. I'm going to move on to the students who are eligible to receive services. I mentioned on a previous slide that funds must be used to provide services to students who reside in the district from which the funds were generated. So here I've created just a little example of that. Uh, so we have private school A, it's located in district A, and it has 500 students attending it. Those students reside in districts A, B, and C. Of those 500 students, there are 55 students who generate Title I funds. Um, those students live in districts A and B. So of the 250 students um, from district A, it looks like 40 of them qualify as low income and would otherwise attend a Title I school within District A. There are another 15 students from District B who qualify as low income and would otherwise attend a Title I school within District B. We can see for District C, there are no students who um, qualify as low income and would attend a Title I school in District C. So it's those 55 students from Districts A and B who generate funds. Students who are not low income are not going to generate funds for the private school. So who is eligible to receive services? We'll go uh, district by district here. So for District A, the funds that are generated by those 40 students from Title I served schools must be used to provide services to the most at-risk students from the 250 students who reside in District A and attend the private school. Uh, multiple educationally related criteria must be used to identify a student as at risk. So some examples of that are test scores, grades, teacher recommendations, etc. So to be clear, the funds do not have to be used on the 40 students who generated them. Just because a student generates funds by being low income, that doesn't mean that they are academically at risk. And additionally, low income status is not an allowable criterion for identifying a student as at risk. And that's in uh, question C3 of the guidance. Sometimes we do see that on the GMAP application on the private school page. You're supposed to list those multiple educationally related criteria. You can't list low income for that criteria uh, because that is not uh, not allowable. OK, if we want to know who can receive services in District B, the services are going to be provided to the most at risk students um, from the 200 students who reside in District B. Again, funds can be used to provide services to any of those students, not just the 15 who generated the funds. And then finally, District C, students from District C are not eligible to receive services because no students from District C generated funds. Um, it would not be equitable to provide services to District C students because if they attended their assigned public school, they wouldn't be receiving Title I services. And if you look at question C1 of the guidance, there are more details on which students are um, eligible for services. Uh, for providing services to private stu school students outside of the district, um, the district can choose to provide those services themselves, just like they do for the private schools that are within their geographic boundaries. Um, they are the ones who are responsible for providing services to the child, but in some scenarios, some districts arrange to have services provided by the LEA in which the private school is located and just reimburse that LEA for the costs. Now, in the event that another district is going to be providing services for students from your district, you want to make sure that both districts participate in the consultation process. That's going to help ensure that appropriate services are being provided, because again, at the end of the day, you're the district that's responsible. So you want to make sure that you're involved in that conversation. 
And finally, this is just a little table of some of the frequently asked questions that come up surrounding equitable services. Um, you can also see there's the link to that non-regulatory guidance that I've been referencing and references to the answers for all of these questions. So the first one is, may the district implement a school-wide program in a private school? And the answer is no. A school-wide program is designed to upgrade the entire educational program in a school. And equitable services are only provided to students identified as most at risk. Essentially, what you're doing is you're operating a targeted assistance program in the private school. Therefore, you can't use the Title I funds to upgrade the entire educational program. So a couple examples of this. Um, funds cannot be used for all of the private school teachers to attend a professional development session. Um, funds could not be used to send an entire class at the private school on um, an instructional field trip. The next question, who's responsible, responsible for planning and designing the equitable services? That's the district. You're responsible for planning, designing, and implementing equitable services after that meaningful consultation with the private school officials. What are some examples and types of services that are available to private school students? There's a list of examples in question C15 of the guidance. Now, it's not an all-inclusive list, but some of the more common examples of services include um, instructional services, tutoring, counseling, etc. And don't forget to reach out to your Title I consultant with any questions about allowable services for private schools. Uh, the next question is, may an LEA just provide a private school with materials and supplies? And the answer is no. Instructional materials and supplies on their own do not constitute a proper Title I program, and they also do not meet the requirement of equitable services. When do the Title I services at the private school need to start? They're supposed to start at the same time as the Title I program for public school participants. So generally that's going to be at or near the beginning of the school year. And can the private school arrange for Title I services and activities and then just submit an invoice uh, to the district for reimbursement? And the answer is no. Remember that the private school officials are not authorized to obligate or receive Title I funds. That's going to wrap up our overview of equitable services. So um, let's see if anyone has any questions. I think I see something in the in the chat. Um, OK, let's see. Do do I know when the declaration of participation will be sent? Nope, I don't. <laughs> but once it is, you will be notified for sure. Um, When I notify private schools, thinking of home schools, if I know low in, um, yes, still send it to get that information and then you can see if if the students are low income and if they would qualify. And let me uh, check the email really quickly here. Erin, I would say on that first question about the declaration, um, you, people could reach out to Thelma Hawkins about that one. Okay. And then I, I want to go back to slide 20 just real yeah. quickly. If um, if you are working with another district as the fiscal agent in, in, per, in the district who's going to carry out services, we would highly recommend that you have a district to district agreement about responsibilities, including things like deadlines, when should funds uh, be sent to the fiscal agent. Um, how is evaluation and consultation going to work to include both districts? Because ultimately, the the district that is not the fiscal agent still has a responsibility to ensure that those services are being carried out faithfully, and and that there there are some consultation services going on, and that there um, is some evaluation of those services. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, I, I don't see any questions in the email or any more in the chat. So um, be sure to mark your calendars for our future webinars. Our next one is going to be a, a leap year webinar, February 29th. Um, oh, I, I see another question in the chat. Hang on. Um, when do you anticipate revised allocations to be loaded into GMAP? I noticed it is posted on the website, but it's not in GMAP yet. 
Are we waiting for revised allocations and other title programs before they can update GMAP? Um, they do try to wait and you know put everything in there all at the same time. I don't have an exact date yet. I, I would anticipate sooner rather than later. Um, it's probably all I can say on that, but you can go and check out that um, the award notifications and use those along with um, the hold harmless information to start planning for next year. Um, oh, I had something else I was gonna say about it and then it completely went out of my head. It'll come back to me. Oh, I know what it was. Um, I am going to send out an email to all of the district coordinators when that is uploaded into GMAP, just so that you know. Um, that's been some feedback we've received previously, so I'm going to make sure that I do that. And I do want to remind you that your final allocation is uploaded if your original application has been fully KDE consolidated consultant approved. I know we still have some that have not received full approval yet. So until that happens, your final allocation will not be uploaded in, in there. So make sure you go into GMAP and you check the status of your application, see if it's approved. Maybe it's waiting on you to make some revisions, in which case um, take a look at the consolidated checklist. Make sure that you've addressed all of the issues on there. Reach out to any of the applicable programs that you need to and um, get that submitted and approved as, as quickly as you can so that you can get your final allocation. All right, um, before we go, I always like to remind you that we do um, value your feedback and we wanna learn about what you'd like to see more of in these webinars what's useful to you, um, also what you want to see in our newsletters, just anything. So if you've got any comments, ideas, or questions, and you want to keep those anonymous, we have an optional anonymous webinar feedback survey. Um, that's always linked in the Title I newsletter, and it's also been linked in the webinar reminder email that you received this morning. Um, and of course, you can always send those things to me or to your assigned Title I consultant as well. Um, and I'll do a quick... Last check for questions. I'm not seeing any more. So thank you all for joining us and we will see you in February.